<laughs> You're right. Yeah. Marcus has a very good reputation, and if he still wants to do it, maybe he can take it. Okay. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Robotics Institute uh, seminar series event of the summer. I and series times. Sorry, <laughs> telling things. All right. Uh, so it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Frank Park, uh, who is going to give us an exciting talk. Um, just a little bit about Frank. Uh, he said to be brief. I will try and be brief, but his bio has many, many great things. Um, uh, Frank uh, was at a couple of institutions you may recognize. Uh, he did his bachelor's degree at MIT, and then his PhD in applied math at Harvard. Uh, he was on the faculty at UC Irvine, uh, starting in 91, and since 1995 has been at Seoul National uh, University. Uh, he's a fellow of the IEEE, uh, currently the president of the Robotics and Automation Society. Um, and uh, I think many of you have probably seen uh, the textbook he co-wrote with Kevin Lynch, uh, Modern uh, Robotics uh, Mechanics Planning and Control. It's a fantastic book, so um, if you haven't looked at it, please grab a copy. Um, also, he's put together an edX course uh, on uh, robotics uh, uh, mechanics and control as well. So um, I won't belabor uh, any further uh, points, but it's a pleasure to introduce Frank and also just to say he's done a tremendous amount of service for our community, and so we should all be, uh, A, very appreciative of that, and also be extremely excited to hear what he has to say today. So, Frank, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, so I was just told about the University of Toronto time. Uh, back where I come from, we call that Korea time. So uh, I think it's pretty universal. Um, just, just before I begin, I want to just uh, open credits. Uh, you know, the, the work I'm going to be talking about today is really the work of uh, uh, five uh, uh, really great uh, former students of mine uh, at the uh, uh, at Seoul National University. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you more about them later uh, as I introduce their work. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off by relating to you maybe three sort of personal events. Um, uh, that I think are related to robot models and learning. So when you give talks like this, you're always thinking about how do I package everything? And, and, and so this might be a, a good way to sort of you know, put everything together. So the first um, uh, item is, uh, uh, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, you know, I, I did write a textbook with Kevin Lynch, and the publisher uh, approached me uh, about a second edition. And I said, well, the first edition it came out in 2017. You know, it's only been five, six years. Uh, but you know, so we went ahead and looked through the chapters, and we we're trying to decide, uh, you know, what additional chapters we should uh, uh, put together, what other chapters maybe might need updating, and we got to the grasping part. Uh, and uh, Kevin said, nobody has grasped grasping this way. Uh, you know, so uh, if you've seen the book, you know, it's it, it, you know, forced closure conditions, uh, you know, finding optimal grasp. Uh, you know, that's been a, a pretty active area of research for the past 20, 30 years. A lot of, a lot of, right? But as you know, nobody is grasping that way anymore. It's all deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, right? Uh, so, you know, that got me to thinking. Um, what other chapters, uh, uh, you know, might be gone? And so, I, I think we're going to keep it. I think we're going to keep it. But nevertheless, it does raise this important question. Uh, the second uh, event was, um, uh, I was at the uh, ICRA in London uh, last week as were many of you. And they had a new competition this year called the, uh, the Quadruped Challenge. Uh, pretty interesting. I must say the competitions are getting more dynamic and more fun. But, but this one, um, uh, I, I was hanging out with the, uh, uh, with the teams. And it looks like roughly the teams could be divided into two camps. Those that use MPC, Model Predictive Control, and those that use reinforcement learning. Uh, and you know, both uh, you know, they adhere to their you know, uh, core beliefs like a religion. Uh, but by the end of the day, in the competition, the MPC guys were saying, yeah, maybe it's time to abandon ship and go to RL. Um, uh, because it, it turns out that you know, most of the RL teams did better. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, you know, if you ask uh, uh, Marco Huru or, or Sanbei Kim or any of the guys who are really working the field, they'll, they'll tell you that, no, 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 you, 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 need, you still need both. But nevertheless, at the competition, uh, I think the RL teams did do considerably better. 
Uh, and the last event was something that actually took place a couple of years ago. You know, we had a very uh, um, uh, sort of a uh, very stimulating uh, panel on um, the future of robotic manipulation, and you know, it was organized by Oliver Brock, and we had Matt Mason, uh, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez, many people, and so the discussion invariably led to this question. Is end-to-end -end learning for robot manipulation feasible? Is it going to happen like it did for vision? Right? Um, and so I think that's a good sort of lead-in to today's talk. You know, um, so you know, roughly can be posed as model-based or learning-based. Um, and I think this is something that I think, uh, you know, as robotics researchers, we're, we're seeing this um, you know, happening you know, right before our eyes. You know, robots are becoming more high-dimensional. Uh, they're performing more complex tasks in unstructured environments. And it's becoming pretty clear, you know, what the limits of so-called traditional, and I say traditional with quotes, uh, uh, model-based methods are. Uh, you know, uh, in the past, they worked well, you know, picking up objects in very structured environments. You have accurate models of the object, the robot, it works fine. But now things are getting more complicated. Uh, and these models are only as good as the accuracy of the model parameters. And you know, if, if you have very expensive equipment in a lab and you can uh, take accurate measurements, it works fine. But you know, that's not the trend these days, right? You, you want to use very low-cost, cheap sensors and, and, and uh, uh, you know, identify models very quickly. So we all know what's happening, right? So you know, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there is this growing optimism, right? Uh, maybe if we collect enough data and we use uh, the right deep learning algorithms, we could just do away with models, the traditional, you know, mechanics, physics-based models altogether. And, you know, that inevitably leads to the question, will these model-free machine learning methods someday make so-called traditional models obsolete? And I think the answer is, and I think most of you will agree with me, not yet, not yet. Maybe in the future, before I would say I'm crazy, not in my lifetime, but, but I'm backing off that now. Maybe it could happen. Uh, uh, but I think for now, we need both traditional and model-based methods, right? Uh, so robotics is different from vision. Um, you know, the data requirements are much more uh, uh, prohibitive than, uh, than you know, images. Um, and to really, sort of uh, effectively leverage these new learning algorithms, we still need models and representations. Uh, so that's one of the main messages. Uh, the other message, and, and hopefully a practical one, um, is that I want to try to convince you that differential geometry uh, offers a very powerful set of techniques uh, uh, that can help you do a lot of things. Um, a couple things. Well, the first thing is that model identification uh, is not a solved problem yet. Uh, and it turns out that geometric methods uh, offer a very uh, powerful set of ways to actually um, identify better models, more accurate models. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, these geometric methods can help you find better latent space representations, better uh, task-specific models that you can use for learning, and that they can also uh, uh, help you to construct um, sort of equivariant um, uh, networks, uh, deep learning networks. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But, but th this is actually useful for vision-based manipulation. OK, so uh, I've divided the talk into uh, uh, sort of four parts. Um, I probably have way too many slides, so I, I, I have a feeling I'm going to be rushing it at the end. But uh, I'll try to get through it quickly, OK? So all right, so uh, geometry. I want to tell you about geometry. Um, so differential geometry, to some of you, you know, who have experience, okay, you understand it, but to, you know, to most of you, or well, well, to many of you who have not seen it for the first it's a scary subject. You know, you pick up a differential geometry text, but the notation is pretty scary, so I'm going to try to demystify that. But a uh, little bit of history. So we all know Gauss. Um, turns out he spent a lot of time uh, thinking about practical problems. Um, and the practical problem, you know, back in his day, was making maps. You know, so today it's large language models, <laughs> sending rockets to the moon. Uh, back then, it was ma map making. Uh, so this looks like, you know, from far away, it looks like you know just a bunch of patterns of cows or something. But if you look very closely, they're actually maps. 
maps of the maps of the earth. Um, so what's the challenge? Um, well, you know, maps are flat, right? So it'd be nice if you draw if a straight line on your map corresponded to shortest path on the sphere. But you know that's not the case, right? So to draw a straight line from where I am to Toronto, uh, that's not the shortest path. So that's the problem that they were uh, trying to figure out. What is a good map so that a straight line on a flat map is as close as possible to being a shortest path on the sphere? Um, so here's a standard map, the one that probably most of you uh, encountered when you were uh, in kindergarten, right? So these kind of maps are, are good, they're pretty accurate uh, if you live near the equator, okay? Uh, but we know as you get closer to the poles, there's a lot of distortion. Things get blown up, all right? So as an example, uh, on the map, Greenland and Africa look to be the same size, when in fact, that's the actual size, all right? So there's a lot of distortion going on. And so if you were to draw perfect circles on the Earth, and you projected these circles to the map, this is what it would look like, all right? So things get really distorted near the poles. So people try to look for better maps. And these are some other maps, okay? So you might say, hmm, this, this looks kind of strange. So what, what's, what's the advantage of making a map like this? And, the fact, and for this map, the areas come out roughly at right. You know, the proportion of Greenland to Africa. Of course, Greenland is squashed, so the shape is, is distorted. But the areas are pretty close, okay? And these are other maps, okay? So this was the, you know, sort of the big technical challenge of, of map makers back then. And, and a lot of Gauss's work was actually, uh, you know, he's thinking about this problem. And here's a, uh, and, and so why? Why is it so hard to make accurate maps of the Earth? Why is there no standard map? And the reason is that you can't flatten the sphere without distortion. So here's a high school uh, science teacher, very passionate about his profession, showing that you can't flatten the sphere without distortion. So he's trying, and he's saying, see, wrinkles, folds, you can't do it. All right, so uh, Hilbert, uh, right, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th, 20th century, um, Hilbert's 20 right, uh, problems. Uh, he wrote this uh, great book called Geometry and the Imagination. Uh, just, just lots of stuff in there. But one of the messages that he's trying to um, deliver in this book is the idea of coordinate invariance. Okay, and this is, uh, this is the part where over the next few slides I'm going to try to uh, uh, convince you that, oh, Riemannian geometry, oh, that's just high school calculus on the sphere. Uh, I don't know if I'll succeed, but give it a shot. Okay, so uh, let, let's look at this circle here. And I have, I have pick three points on this circle, A, B, and C. Okay. And I ask you, what's the average of those three points, A, B, and C? So I'm, I'm guessing most of you will probably sort of measure the distance from A to B along the circle, and the distance from B to C along the circle, and you know, add them up, divide by two, right, or three, right? And you'll probably get this point here, the red circle, right? Some of you who overthink the problem <laughs> might do this instead. Might look at the x, y, z coordinates of A, B, and C, add them all up, divide by three, and get the average to be this. And you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's off the circle. I know what I'll do. I'll just project it back to the circle. And you get this extrinsic mean. Okay. So that's another way of doing it. Um, which way is better? Well, I would argue that the intrinsic mean is better. But, uh, but really, uh, it depends on the coordinates that you use to parameterize these points. Okay. Here's a similar example. So. Uh, I give you two matrices, uh, P0 and P1. So these are symmetric, positive, definite. 
matrices, and I ask you to take the average of those two matrices. So most of us, seeing the problem for the first time, would probably just add the two and divide by add the two matrices together, divide by two, right? And so you would get this. Four and four along the diagonals. Okay. Uh, but the problem with this is that uh, if you take the determinant of P0 and P1 and compare it to the determinant of uh, what I call the arithmetic mean, it's different, right? And so we say, well, you know, it could happen, so what? Uh, but if you think about, um, you know, what the determinant means, remember the determinant is the area of the parallel pipette, remember that? You learned that in the algebra. Uh, and if you want to endow these matrices with some physical meaning, you know, you can, you can want to think of them as covariance matrices, for example then the volume, the determinant, means something. And you would like the determinant to be preserved. Right? So if you take the intrinsic mean in which the determinant is preserved, you get something else. Okay? Uh, so the point is that when you take averages, uh, it depends on the choice of coordinates that you're using. And so this is a problem. This is a problem. You want to be able to do things so that you know, the coordinates I use and the coordinates you use, we still end up getting the same result. Okay, that's what uh, geometry is in, in essence, in, you know, and, and it's core, that's what it's about. Okay, so here is the part where I uh, try to demystify Riemannian geometry to a problem in high school calculus. Okay, so we have a curve on the sphere, and I'm going to parameterize the curve by x, d, y, t, and z of t. And we agree to take that incremental arc length, like Euclidean arc length, is the usual formula, right? That's the notion of Euclidean distance that we use. So uh, you know, if we express uh, a point on the sphere using the usual spherical coordinates, for example, theta and phi, right? Then x is like cosine theta, sine phi, y is right? sine theta, sine phi, z is cosine phi, or something like that. Right. And then you calculate dx, dy, dz, it's, it's messy. You square them, add them all up. You get something relatively simple. Okay. And you can write it this way. Okay, so what you've done here is you've, you've expressed incremental arc length uh, in terms of the spherical coordinates, theta and phi. And it looks like this. Right. And so this matrix is something special. That's called the uh, first fundamental form. Uh, we'll call it the Riemannian metric. Okay. So this Riemannian metric is is very special. You know, it's it's actually the most fundamental thing. Because once you have that Riemannian metric, then you can actually calculate curve the length of curves, right? Using this formula, uh, works out to this. You can also calculate areas of patches on the sphere um, by taking, well, I've written it here, so you know, the determinant of G square root is the area element or, or the volume element in higher dimensions. And so here's the setup, right? So you've chosen local coordinates for the sphere, then and phi. Uh, you've calculated the Riemannian metric. I say ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Uh, and then, now you have a means of calculating lengths and areas on the sphere. Okay. Now, a couple notes. Um, other coordinates are possible. Right? Uh, we're using spherical coordinates. There are other ways to parameterize a sphere. Uh, other choices of Riemannian metric are possible by defining you know, incremental arc lengths differently. Okay. Um, it could be something as general as this. Okay, that in a nutshell is Riemannian geometry. Okay, so the sphere now becomes some arbitrary higher dimensional, multi-dimensional surface, um, which we call a manifold. Okay, and we have local coordinates for this manifold, just like we have local coordinates for the sphere. And the Riemannian metric is the key concept. So that's something that you choose. Okay, so there are engineering decisions to be made in the problems that we tackle in the right? Uh, that's 
the, the, the choice of Riemannian metric is usually uh, guided by these choice, by, by these uh, uh, you know, real world constraints. So you have a uh, Riemannian metric, uh, I mean, you have a Riemannian manifold with local coordinates. You choose a Riemannian metric. Uh, and then, in terms of the coordinates you choose, you can just right, express the Riemannian metric as this M by M matrix. Okay. And once you have this set up, now you're able to calculate the lengths of curves, volumes, in a way such that it does not depend on the choice of coordinates. Because when you change coordinates, the Riemannian metric also changes coordinates, and it all works out so that you get the same result. The same formula for length, the same formula for volumes, areas, so on. And so you can carry this further to mappings between reminding manifolds. Okay? Uh, so you can have uh, one manifold M mapped to another manifold N, and you can give, uh, put a reminding structure on M and N. And so, what does this have to do with robots? Okay, so here's one example. So a typical robot, uh, we, we know four kinematics. So the joint space is a manifold, the task space is another manifold. The four kinematics defines a mapping from the uh, joint space manifold to the task space manifold. You can define the remaining metric in joint coordinates and the task space coordinates. Um, of course, yeah, a couple uh, notes, right? Mappings may be complicated. Uh, sometimes the manifolds might be unknown or changing. For example, robots, uh, right? Two robots uh, suddenly holding an object together. The kinematic structure changes, so the manifold changes. Uh, and Hermannian metrics. Sometimes it's not clear what the metric should be, okay? But you do have this setup. Now, um, this being Canada. Uh, you guys have right, higher appreciation of right, art, movies, and humor. <laughs> Maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, I know Jonathan has, right? So uh, there's a scene in this movie where, uh, this, so this is a uh, Rob Reiner film, right? It's a, uh, it's a spoof parody of you know the big metal bands in the 1980s, right? So Spinal Tap, uh, they claim to be the loudest band in the world. Loudest band in the world. Because all their bands, you know, their amplifiers, they go to 10, right? But, but their amps, they go to 11. Right? So he says, while other bands go to 10, you know, if we need that little extra oof, we can go to 11, right? Uh, so Rob, Rob Reiner, you know, he plays the interview and says, well, why don't you just call your uh, 11 to 10? Uh, isn't that the same thing? And his friend says, but these go to 11. So the reason I bring this up is, uh, you know, when I was editor of, uh, of, of Transactions, you know, one reviewer, um, sometimes you get some interesting reviews, and, and uh, this reviewer said, you know, this guy's paper reminds me of Spinal Tap. <laughs> He's saying his paper, you know, his method is the best because they go to 11, whereas others go to 10. So this is a good example of coordinate invariance, or lack of coordinate invariance, unless if you agree on you know, a certain set of coordinates, right? Uh, you, you can make all these kind of outrageous claims that have no basis, okay? Okay, so that was part one. And I'm already behind schedule, okay. All right, so let's now talk about some models. Um, this is familiar stuff, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. Kinematics, dynamics, right? <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, so, very classic robot. This is considered a simple robot. Here's the dynamics. So in 1986, you could write a paper uh, just deriving the dynamic equations of, of this robot, and it would be published in April. And if you look at the names, these guys are you know, big names, Shana Khatib and Joel Murray. So this is their 1986 paper. So dynamics, page one, page two, page three. Okay, and that's it. Okay. Uh, so, here's an idea. Ooh, it gets, gets pretty complicated once you get to the dynamics level. Uh, what do you use these models for? Uh, you know, obvious applications. Control, you need dynamic models. Uh, motion planning, especially if you want to do uh, motion optimization, you need the dynamic equations. Collision detection, you also need the dynamics. 
uh, uh, if you're working on uh, wearables or rehab devices, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, having the dynamics model around is very useful. And of course, the obvious simulation. Uh, and this is kind of interesting, right? Um, you know, because it's so hard to collect data using real robots, uh, people use simulators to generate data. Um, so they call it sim to real. Okay, it's a, a, a very uh, popular application of simulators. Okay, so robot models are obviously only as good as the accuracy of the model parameters. Right? So, um, you know, this raises the question, how accurate should a robot model be? Uh, for, you know, problems like this, you can just get by with kinematics. You know, it, it, it's very structured, uh, you know, the, the, you know, whatever you're doing, the parts are where they're supposed to be, uh, very simple. Um, for walking robots, um, you don't need the full dynamics. Some simple models will do, you know, like point mass models or inverted pendulum models, they seem to work well. Once you get to um, robots that, are, that have more contact and performing a you know, broader range of tasks, oops, sorry, um, the situation changes. This is a, uh, right, so, uh, you need more complete dynamic models. Okay, so. All right, and, you know, robots are always picking up things, uh, dropping them, um, so the dynamics is continuously changing. Right? So, um, the older guys will know, but, but, you know, there used to be something called adaptive control. Um, uh, now it's maybe it's called learning or something, but uh, you know this is an old old thing. Uh, Model-based adaptive control laws uh, 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 need models. Okay. Okay. So you need models, and the models are only as good as the accuracy of the parameters. So why is it so hard? Well, why is it harder? If you are just working with your Franklin robot in your in your lab, and it's just you know not even picking up objects, just moving the arm around, it's easy. Uh, especially if you have good good sensors to measure the you know, end effect of location and orientation. Uh, these days, right, some of these humanoids can have you know 20, 30 degrees of freedom. Uh, if you count up all the parameters that need to be identified, they, they number in several hundreds. Right? You want to use cheap sensors, right? And these are noisy. Uh, and so ultimately, model identification reduces to an optimization problem, which is terrible, right? Non-convex, uh, it's very sensitive, doesn't work. Uh, so here, here's, some, here's some of the things you have to go through. Measurements, you, you, have, to, you have to strap your you know, quadruped to a table and do this. Right? Or, or, or strap your humanoid to, you know, to the wall and do that. Or in the case of a humanoid, you know, uh, well, I guess this is uh, just using a uh, simple, uh, it's a lot of work. And, you know, the measurements sometimes may not be very accurate. Um, so some people say, I'll just hell with it. You know, I'll just use the CAD models. Uh, they're good enough. And sometimes they end up being better than the actual measurements. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of a small thing, but, but for those of you who, um, you know, uh, have looked at you know, this model identification problem. You know, we have the kinematics and we have the dynamics. And typically, what we do is we do the kinematics first, uh, and then, and then we do the dynamics. Uh, but the problem is that the dynamics model includes kinematic parameters in there. And if you do a bad job of estimating the kinematic parameters, you're going to do a very bad job of estimating the dynamic parameters. And uh, kind of a small thing, but it just it was kind of surprising that uh, you know, nobody had really uh, noticed this or, or written about it. So, uh, uh, Chen Kwan actually uh, uh, addressed this in his thesis, but uh, we won't talk about this too much. But, um, you know, the basic kinematic identification procedure you know, proceeds like this, right? You, so, you measure the end effector's position or orientation at several poses, pose one, pose two, pose three. Uh, and then you have a kinematic model, and the kinematic model thinks uh, the pose is here when in fact it's there. It's here when in fact it's there. So, uh, you measure the difference and you adjust the kinematic model parameters accordingly. Okay. 
Uh, so this is us expressing that uh, procedure in equations. Dynamic model identification also proceeds in a similar way. Right? Uh, but this time, you now have to um, measure uh, like, uh, with respect to trajectories. So the dynamic equations look something like this. And the parameters that you are trying to estimate, they're things like masses, inertias. Uh, and of course, embedded in those are you know, kinematic parameters like lengths and angles and things like that. So ultimately, um, I'll skip that. Um, ultimately, what you do, uh, you know, do the, do the data collection, it ultimately reduces to a problem like this, right? So it looks like your, fa your standard least squares problem, you know, ax equals b, or instead of x, I, I use phi. So you're trying to find the parameter phi, and this is a, this is a huge set of, you know, it's a huge vector. Uh, containing lengths, uh, you know, masses and inertias of all the lengths, uh, uh, and you're trying to minimize uh, a phi minus b, right? Of course, there's a catch. Uh, the catch is that phi is just not any x, but it has to satisfy certain physical properties. Um, and uh, those of you who have uh, studied multi-body systems, I know there's a, there's a strong tradition in, in Toronto, multi-body dynamics, it may have been lost. Um, but, um, so, here's a typical rigid body. Um, and there are a couple things, right, about rigid bodies that we can say. Masses are not negative, masses have to be positive. Uh, inertia matrices, inertia tensors, have to be positive definite. And this is something that I actually, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't know until recently. Uh, but there's another, uh, something called, a, I guess, a triangle inequality for rigid body inertia. And it's, it's a bit, um, uh, I'm not sure if I can explain this in an intuitive way, but you know, it reduces to the, this, these sort of conditions, uh, where the eigenvalues of the inertia matrix have to satisfy this, you know, this uh, set of three inequalities. Okay, so uh, phi has to uh, satisfy some special constraints. And there's also the question of uh, generating trajectories. So, you know, when you're measuring, you want the robot to move. Right? Uh, but you have to make sure that the trajectory is interesting, exciting. You know, if it's just doing this motion, it's not very useful. You want it to be doing a lot of uh, different types of uh, motions. Okay, so there's a lot that's going on. But anyways, if you use lousy sensors, uh, and if you just use standard what you learned in um, you know uh, linear algebra about least squares, and you solve, try to uh, identify the dynamic parameters, you're going to end up getting results like this. Okay, so it should look something like this, but you get something like this. Okay, so. Uh, this first example, where the power of geometric methods uh, uh, becomes evident. Um, so Pat Lysen at Notre Dame, um, very nice paper in 2017. He showed that um, the, the mass inertia parameters of a rigid body, if you embed them into this 4x4 four four matrix in this way, I won't go into the details, um, then it turns out that this matrix, being positive definite, corresponds to all those other properties that I talked about earlier. Right? Mass is being positive, inertia is being positive definite, and satisfying the triangle inequality. This was a, a pretty remarkable um, uh, piece of work. Uh, because now, what it allows you to do is if now, um, so you set up the problem this way. And now, if you embed the mass and inertia parameters into these set of phi's, uh, you get a phi equals b. Uh, but now, you get these set of constraints, and I think it's best explained in the next graph here. Okay. So, you're trying to find the phi such that a phi is as close as possible to being b. All right, so, um, your phi has to lie on, so I've illustrated it in that somewhat yellowish plane. That's your solution space. 
you have to find the phi, uh, a phi that lies on that plane. Uh, but now, the columns of the rows of A define these hyperplanes. So H1, H2, H3, I've labeled it up to H whatever. And so your job is to find the phi uh, that is, um, well, so, so what you do is, in the case of hyperplane H1, find the point on the hyperplane uh, that is closest to um, your initial point phi. Uh, sorry, so, so find the point on this solution plane that is closest to hyperplane H1. So it'll be some point. Now find the point on the solution, solution space that's closest to H2. So you get, you get a bunch of these points. Now there are a bunch of points on this, this solution space. Right? And now, you're trying to find the phi that minimizes this distance function. So uh, these are the projections of the hyperplanes to the solution space. And so this turns out being, uh, turns out and ends up being uh, an optimization on the space of symmetric positive matrices. And I know some of you are working on, you know, semi-definite programming, so you have a lot of experience uh, uh, in this problem. Um, and so there's something called information geometry, uh, uh, and I think the book by Amari, uh, published in 1993, is the definitive reference. It's not a very readable reference. Um, uh, I see many of you nodding in agreement. Um, but the basic idea is that the set of probability distributions forms a it, it, uh, and, and the probability distributions are parameterized by some parameter theta. Uh, this forms a, an m-dimensional Riemannian manifold. So we talked about Riemannian manifolds. Uh, you know, it, it's called a statistical manifold. And on, so, uh, example, right, Gaussian distributions. Um, you know, they're parameterized by the mean and the, and the covariates, for example. Uh, this forms a, uh, a statistical manifold. Neural networks can also be viewed as um, you know, uh, statistical manifolds. Um, and so, you know, one of the key ideas of information geometry is that on statistical manifolds, there is a very natural Riemannian metric given by the Fisher information matrix. Okay. So it's this ugly looking thing. Um, so. Uh, Here's uh, an example, worked that example for Gaussian distributions, right? And, you know, um, we're always, so, you know, a lot of applications actually come up where you have to measure the distance between two Gaussian distributions. Uh, and, you know, people don't really think too much about it, but if you do it the right way, meaning you, you think of this as a statistical manifold with a natural Riemannian metric and you use that to calculate shortest distances, um, then it leads to a set of formulas. And these, these are actually, these formulas were known. Um, turns out they were known uh, a while ago. Uh, so you have to solve these differential equations. It's a mess. It's a mess. Uh, but you can do it for, you know, some simple Gaussians. So uh, here's an example uh, of two Gaussians, two-dimensional. Um, here's the first Gaussian. Here's the second Gaussian. So the means and the covariance are, covariances are indicated by the ellipses. So you can ask the question, what is the shortest path from this Gaussian to this Gaussian? Right? Uh, so normally, uh, you know, people just draw a straight line and they would just, you know, make the ellipsoids, right, evolve smoothly to, from one to the other. But if you solve those differential equations, you get a very clear solution. A specific solution looks like this. Okay? And the length of this path, you can measure using the Riemannian metric. Okay, okay so, um, right, other reasons. Um, so if you don't buy the, you know, the natural Riemannian, you know, why it's natural, then, you know, uh, the other uh, uh, convincing argument could be that, hey, if you change uh, the coordinates, by an affine transform, um, then it turns out that Riemannian metric 
is invariant uh, to these f component transformations. Um, so you use this geometric distance, and you do a lot better. Uh, you get something pretty good. So this is actually a, a Taylor's contribution, a uh, uh, very nice piece of work. And you can actually take this idea and, and apply it to adaptive control. Um, you can also right, uh, use this uh, to generate you know, trajectories that are exciting. Um, you know, I won't uh, go into the details here. All right, so here's the takeaway. Um, so using the geometry of PN, you can actually do a lot better in uh, identifying accurate uh, dynamic models. Um, but it's still a lot of work. So, you know, the question arises, right? Is it worth it? You know? What have we missed? What do these models miss? Right? And what I haven't told you is that, right, there's a lot going on. Like if you open up a robot, uh, you know, uh, it's not just rigid bodies. Uh, you know, there are actuators in there, there are gears, there are transmissions, you know, and there's, there's friction, there's compliance, uh, it, it's a mess, right? And so do these models capture all these effects? Um, sometimes uh, they do, right? Especially if they're doing a, a narrow set of tasks. But if you want, like, if you want robots to perform very fast, complex, dynamic motions, these things do end up mattering. Um, so then the temptation arises, ah, hell with it, you know, let's just collect a bunch of data and, and use my favorite deep learning network. Um, so my, uh, you know, people have different ideas about this, you know, my, my, my thing is, you know, uh, you know I, you go as far as you can with physics and mechanics based models, you know, identify them as, much, you know, as accurately as you can using some of these geometric methods. Uh, and when they come up short, then turn to these learning and data driven models to augment these traditional models. Um, and so, you know, uh, based on my experience, you know, uh, you, uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, works these days that use, uh, you know, like Gaussian process dynamic models, for example, in place of, uh, you know, classical mechanic based models. I don't find them particularly effective. Uh, but, you know, some people uh, will, you know, uh, argue uh, otherwise. Okay, part three. Okay, uh, changing gears a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna go more toward um, sort of traditional, uh, uh, sort of mainstream machine learning. Okay. Um, you know, the data that we deal with, high dimension, right? Um, so there's something called the manifold hypothesis. And it says that, you know, although the data lies in a very high dimensional space, there's some structure to it. This data usually lies in some lower dimensional curved space. And, and this is Young and Lee. Um, so, right, uh, images are very high dimensional, but if you just look at these set of images, if we had rotated like this, you can capture it just as a one dimensional manifold, right? Uh, and the same goes for robot motions. You know, for example, you know, robot pouring water into a cup. You move the cup on at different locations on the table, right? Uh, you know, it, it lies on some two-dimensional manifold. Um, so, the problem of manifold representation level one is it? So you have these data points in a very high-dimensional space, and you know you believe the manifold hypothesis holds because if it doesn't, there's nothing you can do. So, you know, there's probably some lower-dimensional manifold that fits these data points. And remember, when you see manifold, now just think sphere, okay? The reminding, right, the, the calculations. Uh, and you want a set of coordinates for your manifold, a lower dimensional, much smaller than the uh, uh, right data space. And again, I refer back to the sphere problem. Uh, auto encoding, right, widely used. Really the same idea, right? So you have a high-dimensional you know, set of data in high-dimensional space, and the auto encoder, what does it do? It, it takes the high-dimensional data, maps it to a lower-dimensional space via the encoder, and then maps it back to the high-dimensional space via the decoder, right? So 
right? There's a, a latent space in the middle, that's the lower dimensional space, and then the decoder maps it back, and if you've constructed the outer encoder correctly, uh, you know, the inputs pretty much, the outputs pretty much correspond to the inputs. Okay? Oh, what's going on? Okay, so. So I like showing this because it took five seconds to show, but probably it took Jungian five hours to make. Um, all right, so that's the coordinate chart. Um, right? uh, faces, right? Uh, this is a decoder, right? So if you've constructed the audio encoder correctly, um, this is what you're doing. Okay, um, distorted latent space. So we talked about distortions of maps of the sphere, right? Same problem here. Uh, now, if, uh, so on a latent space, you want straight lines, shortest path, to also correspond to shortest path in the manifold, right? So uh, a straight line here, it would be nice if it maps the shortest path, but usually it doesn't, it's squiggly, right? Um, and if you have these distorted latent spaces, well, strange things can happen, right? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you're interpolating between nine and six, you want it to go something like this, but you know, these kind of things happen. Abrupt changes can occur. Um, it goes back to this problem again, right? Um, you know, constructing accurate minimum distortion maps of the Earth. So how do you generalize the manifolds? Um, well, it has to be coordinate invariant, obviously. Uh, so if you have a curve in the input manifold, will map to a curve on the output manifold like this. And so the length of the input curve is that. Length of the output curve is that. These are the formulas. And you want the lengths to be the same, or as close to being the same as possible. And you want this to be true for a lot of curves, all curves. And you also want the angles. You know, when they intersect, there's an angle from them, right? The angle here and the angle here, you want to be the same. Uh, so, work it all out, what does it reduce to? It reduces to um, this condition uh, on the Riemannian metrics and the Jacobian of the mapping F. Right? So it's distortion free when, when this condition is satisfied. Okay, uh, and here's some details on how to construct coordinate invariant measures of distortion. Okay, um, so now there's a hierarchy of these mappings, and, and this is actually in Hilbert's book. Um, you know, the best possible map is in isometry, and no distortion. Right? Of course, in some cases we know that's impossible. If you're mapping a sphere to a, a plane, right, it's, it's impossible to make it completely distortion free. Right? Um, but anyways, best case, next best case, area preserving. Right? We saw that we know in the Greenland versus Africa, right? Uh, and then uh, you know angle preserving. There's a whole hierarchy. Um, so uh, I'm leaving out a lot of details, but there there are ways to construct these distortion measures uh, in a way that's coordinate invariant and meaningful. And you know these are some examples. Um, so if you use traditional um, Sort of embeddings versus one in which we've minimized the distortion, you do much better, right? So the faces are kind of spread out very uniformly and evenly, whereas these are all kind of bunched together in strange ways. Um, you can also do this for uh, uh, data that's non-Euclidean, okay? Uh, so we saw some examples, right? PN, uh, rotations, SE3, these are all examples of non-Euclidean data. Uh, examples involving, um, you know, so mass inertia data again. Uh, autoencoder training, okay, back to autoencoders. Uh, um, you know, if you choose this regularization term such that it reflects the amount of distortion in the map F, um, you can do much better. So, uh, you know, uh, machine learning, uh, we have a they all end this. Right? So if you 
uh, minimize distortion and construct the lead space uh, accordingly. You get a much nicer, clearer right, distribution of these numbers in the lead space. Uh, and more examples. Um, uh, and of course, right, you have to choose Riemannian metric. Uh, and that's the engineering choice. Um, but, so, so the point I want to um, sort of emphasize here is that not just robotics, uh, not just vision, but so many problems in engineering, um, you know, reduced to trying to fit something square or some like a uh, like a round peg into a square hole. We're trying to fit two things that don't fit, right? Uh, and it's, it's kind of surprising to me how many times those problems can be formulated as one of mapping one manifold into another manifold, right? So the idea of you know finding a mapping that minimizes, that reduces distortion is a very universal and, you know, and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, tried to make that uh, connection clear here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to go through this very quickly. Last part. Um, all right, talk about echo rates, okay? Uh, CNNs, right? Why do they work so well? Uh, and I think we, we probably all learned this in our machine learning or, or vision class, right? It's because they are shift Shift equivariant, uh, invariant, uh, it's equivariant, that's the correct term. Right? So what does that mean? Uh, you know, when you segment the image of a cat, you get this. If you shift the cat, you get a shifted version of the output. Right? And so the CNNs have this built-in shift equivariance. And it turns out this idea of equivariance is not just uh, you know important for shifts, but um, so here's an example, and this is actually motivation for this particular line of work, the push manipulation. Um, so uh, if you want to pick up uh, like this green object, you have to move the other objects out of the way first, right? and pick it up. Um, so these days, uh, this is, you know, so if you have an accurate model of the environment, the blocks, the robot, you can actually just, you know, solve the, you know, do the analysis and, and do it, uh, right? Uh, but what people are doing these days is they want to just use vision, so vision-based simulations, right? So before, after, right? I push here, what happens? You try to predict, what does it look like? So in this case, right, you push that green block, what's it going to have, what's going to look like? Delta T seconds later. Okay, so you know, uh, with with vision, right? Uh, you don't have, uh, right? You can't use uh, dynamics. Uh, so it turns out that uh, this almost seems to be developing into kind of a small cottage industry. You know, uh, this this vision-based uh, manipulation problem. There have been a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, neural network type. Uh, uh, where, where you train a network uh, and then you input a scene uh, to get an input, so like a pushing motion, and then it, and then the network will tell you what happens you know, after you push. They don't work very well. I mean, they work for a very narrowly defined task, but uh, generalization uh, is usually not very good. Right? And and so I think uh, now, so we think you know the the reason one of the reasons is that. Uh, well, here's the scenario, right? Uh, if you push this object here, this cube here, it's going to move here. Now, if I just rotate everything, right, and I push from here, it's going to move here. So you don't need to train the network for both these cases. Right? One's just kind of a, a shifted version of the other. Well, shifted here means a, a, a messy two transform. Okay, so this is the idea of equivariance with respect to planar rotations and translations, or SE2, okay? Uh, and so, you know, the, the, you know, the, the data-driven models that I've showed you before, most of them are not SE2, they don't, they're not built in. So you have to train these things with different cases. Um, so, it would be nice if you had a way to construct general equivariant neural networks 
not just for SE2, but maybe arbitrary symmetry. And so this was a, an interesting problem. Uh, and so here's some technical stuff, you know, a model. And again, this is right in the sort of manifold setting, mapping from manifold M to N. And this is the idea of you know, a G equivariance. Um, so I think this, right? Uh, so you know, G, think of that as a rotation, for example. Rotation multiplied by some vector X. You know, takes you to another point on the manifold. Uh, and you can, and the, the rotation also can be defined in the output space, G times Y. So if, if this is true, right? G times X, uh, apply F to it, and you get G times Y. That's equivariant. Yeah. And so one way, so a quick and dirty way to construct an equivariant network is to come up with uh, a mapping G bar that satisfies this condition. So um, it reduces to constructing this, this canonical mapping. Uh, and if you can construct uh, such a mapping, identify such a mapping, then with that mapping you can turn any neural net into an equivariant uh, uh, network by this construction. Okay. Um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, there are other ways. Um, so you can actually take this idea and, and um, you know, try to um, uh, construct, uh, turn an arbitrary neural network into one that's SE2 equivariant. Uh, and here's some examples. Uh, and uh, if you look at these papers, you know, there's a lot, a lot of details, and including experimental studies, and extensions, and proofs, and so on. Uh, I'll go into that. Okay, wow, I, uh, I think I managed to race through everything. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, no long-winded conclusion, just, just two takeaways. Um, the first is that, you know, models, representations, you still need them. I think you still need them, uh, and especially if you want to leverage, uh, you know, these existing machine learning methods. You know, I'd say that you know these model-free end-to-end learning still seems a way off. Uh, and the second point, I guess, is is one I, I hope I, I try to convince you is that differential geometry offers a very powerful set of tools and techniques, uh, not only for learning more academic models but also constructing these lower dimensional representations and trusting group effect equivalent models. And basically, you know, as I said before, anytime you know, you're trying to fit two things that don't fit into each other, you know, it's useful to think about that problem in, as a problem of mapping one manifold into another uh, in a minimum distortion way. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thirty slides. Impressive. We'll do a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay. We're, not, we're not going to do the speak. We'll not. No. You want to grab the mic? No. Use your use your outside voice. All right. Uh, would anybody here like to ask a question? If you are going to ask, just please speak up. Questions? Someone up? Oh, the gentleman in the front. <laughs> so, no, I think I don't need to. No. Right? Yeah. So if you if you think about about neural network architectures, for example, in transformers where they have this, uh, this locate, where they include location information. One interesting observation is that at some point, the inductive biases that we add, if data becomes large enough, may, may become, become obsolete. So what, what is, your, is, or is your thinking about the role of inductive biases? Do you think more data can, can solve? If we build a really good simulator, that can, generate massive amounts of data, will we reach the point where certain inductive biases are more uh, than they give us? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that um, I was just at uh, an ICLR conference, um, and I saw a lot of papers um, analyzing transforming networks, uh, specifically trying to measure equivalence you know, equivariance occurs at each of the layers and try to identify, ha, these are the important the, the, the layers that have the most effect on equivariance. So keep these and throw away these others. Um, so I, I don't know, it probably doesn't answer your question, but, but uh, I, I think 
Um, it's, it's actually, no, it's, it's just very relevant. I guess the question is, do you think that the, having, having like more equivariance for certain tasks, at least at some point, can be, uh, can be replaced by, by more data? Like in a vision transformer, we don't have the same flavor of equivariance we have in the convolutional map. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, if the data were free and plentiful, and, and, and you didn't have to worry about maybe your competition costs, yeah, I suppose that would work. But seems to be towards smaller networks, smaller data, faster training times, and in that case, uh, to me, it, it, it seems worthwhile to try to construct networks that have built in networks. Should I take a choose the remaining metric. Um, yeah, so it depends on the application. Let me try to give you a, 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 an application. So maybe maybe a, a, a robot application, kinematic application. Um, uh, the joint space of, uh, of, of like an open chain, for example. Okay. Um, they're not all weighted the same. Right? Um, an open chain like this, my shoulder joint is, is carrying a lot more mass than my wrist joint. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you want to think of your money metric as maybe the relative sizes of the actuators. Right? So you want a pretty big motor here, and you can have a pretty small motor here. So that can be reflected in the choice of your money metric. So if you have a money metric, it's a diagonal matrix. Rather than choosing pi, uh, you know, weight this term to be pretty large, weight this term to be pretty small. Um, and if you choose that money metric, so uh, interesting connection. You know, have you ever wondered why our fingers are the way they are? Uh, the length, length, right? They're not equal. Uh, mine are roughly in the ratio you know, 3, 2, 1. Uh, by yours. <laughs> 3, 2, 1. So you can actually set this problem up as mapping a three dimensional choice space manifold into the two dimensional plane. You know, right? Let's do this, right? So how do you cover? the xy plane okay, with a three-dimensional manifold in a way that minimizes distortion. So if you use this, um, the remaining distortion setting, and choose the metrics, you know, three, two, one, for example, uh, uh, large and small, you get three, two, one. Uh, so I don't know if that's just a fluke or a coincidence, but uh, interesting. We have a question from YouTube. Florian asks, there have been formulations of optimal control where we find a mapping of images to some latent state and then plan in this space. What are the constraints we should place on these mappings? Say that again. There have been formulations of optimal control where we find a mapping of images to some latent state and then plan in this space. What are the constraints we should place on these mappings? Uh, on the latent space. Okay, um, yeah, so those, those back, back again to my point about what's a good latent space. Right? So if you have two images that are far away, then in the latent space they should be far away. Uh, if they're close together, they should be close together. Right? Yeah. Um, so again, it, it goes to the distortion. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. But, uh, I'm going to sneak in. If you'll indulge me. So, just going back to Emmett's question, uh, what if you, I mean, I talked about this at lunch actually, but what if you don't know the metric? I mean, there's been some work on metric learning. Can you, and then I will just follow it just to put it all together. Your group equivariant networks, do you have to, you must know the group structure in advance, or can you discover the nature of the group? Uh, yeah, so let me answer the first question. Um, so, when I first came upon machine learning, I was, I was disdainful. Uh, this is just black art, you know, it's just, you know, it's just optimization, or it's just function approximation. Um, but then, I, I backed off a little bit. I have a little more respect. Um, uh, so, you know, they, they, so they consider questions like, well, what if you don't know the remaining metric? 
we have to figure out what the appropriate running metric is from the data. So there, there's a whole set of you know techniques there. Um, and so how do you how do you feel? So you know, people try to you know fit you have a bunch of data points and try to you know cluster them get ellipsoids and use the ellipsoids as uh, means to construct and running metrics. Um, uh, collection of techniques. So data might be missing in certain places, and plenty of others, and how do you take that and take that and start running metrics? So, yeah, uh, I think there's a lot more to Oh, just in a similar vein, the group structure. So if you're building a group equivariant network, can you, do you need to inject as a inductive bias the group structure, or do you, can you discover that as well? Uh, yeah, so what I talked about today, I just uh, assumed that the group was known. Uh, so you want to construct a network equivariant with respect to this specific group. Uh, I, I do believe there's some work uh, uh, on trying to discover the uh, group with respect to which uh, any other questions? We'll maybe take one la or not. It depends. Anybody? Last question. You, sir. So, uh, about the group equivariants, I'm wondering, um, you mentioned there are other approaches as well. How does that compare with can uh, the canonical mapping approach? Uh, what is the usual way people choose the canonical mapping there? And what are the limitations of the cons? So, um, so a lot of the so, uh, right, uh, where is the, right, so there's a, a very, very sort of landmark, seminal uh, paper that everybody references. Uh, oh, it's one of the slides I remember. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> a paper called Geometric Deep Learning by you know, Michael Bronstein and, 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 and several as young know, uh, there they address uh, you know, the, the question that um, you're asking. Um, but uh, most of the work that I've seen, um, they're, they're very focused on you know, one particular type of group, you know, on a specific group, SA2 or SA3 or SA3. And they really exploit the, you know, the special properties of SO3 to construct group equivalents. And that's fine, it's pretty efficient. Um, what I've, what I've shown you is sort of a quick and dirty way. Uh, if, if you want to just, if you have an existing neural network that's not equivalent, but you'd like to turn it into something that's equivalent with respect to this particular group, there's a way to do it. Probably they're more efficient ways to do it. Uh, 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 it's one thing. Excellent. Okay, so I think we're, we're just about out of time, so we'll let us thank Professor Park one more time for okay. you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in online, and I think we'll, uh, we'll end the YouTube stream, and I think for those of...